Thank you for joining us today. I'm Michelle Oldfield with the Julian Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, and it is my honor to introduce our moderator, Gina Nichols. Gina is an assistant research professor at the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems, a part of the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation. Gina recently received her PhD from Iowa State University and is an engineer and a got, ooh, I'm gonna say this wrong, agronomist and data scientist by training. Her previous work has focused on quantifying the agron agronomic benefits of diversified crop rotations. In addition to conducting research on sustainable agriculture, she has received several seasons of practical experience working on small scale vegetative farms. Gina, take it away. Right, thanks, Michelle. You did great. I think the word agronomy only exists in Iowa sometimes. Um, but I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Don Stewart. So Don has worked in natural resources and the environment for over 40 years, of which 20 included intensive legislative lobbying on farm, fisheries, and environmental policy. He served as the Pacific Northwest Regional Director for American Farmland Trust from 2000 to 2011. And he's also a former Alaskan commercial salmon troll fisherman, also formerly a practicing Seattle trial attorney and was a Lieutenant in the US Navy Judge Advocate General, General's Corps during the Vietnam War. So in this discussion on his new book, No Farms, No Food, Don will trace the development of the American Farmland Trust that is responsible for landmark achievements in farmland preservation and conservation practices. So, um, before we begin, just a reminder to you, the audience, to enter your questions into the Q&A feature. You can do this at any time, and Michelle will share them with me, and we'll get to as many as we can throughout this hour. So I'll let you take it away, Don. Okay, uh, well, we start with a problem. And that is that uh, at the moment, there are basically 8 billion people on the planet Earth. Uh, just for scale, when I was a kid, which despite appearances wasn't all that long ago, uh, there were two and a half billion people on Earth. Uh, so what that means is that uh, starting about that point in time when human beings emerged on the planet, more or less in the form that we're in today as conscious, intelligent human beings, uh, some 250,000 years passed before we had put two and a half billion people on Earth. And then we proceeded to add another five and a half billion in just one lifetime. Uh, I, I personally find that pretty staggering. Uh, and, I, and, and it poses a question for us, uh, which, okay, so let me see if I can make this slide advance. There we go. Uh, and the challenge is, how are we going to, in a world of eight going on 10 billion people, how are we going to feed ourselves and at the same time preserve the critical ecosystems upon which our survival depends? Uh, clean air, clean water, uh, a temperate climate. How, how do those two things fit together? That's sort of an existential problem uh, that we as human beings face uh, in the years to come. Uh, and so in in walking through this presentation, basically, I'd like to share with you a case study about American Farmland Trust and talk about what AFT's story means uh, for the solution of that problem. Uh, a big part of that story is, a, is collaboration, and that collaboration led to some amazing successes, uh, which in turn affect our prospects for the future. So that's basically a summary of what I hope to talk with you about today. Uh, just a note about the various slides that I have as sort of a backdrop to this presentation. Uh, I think you'll note that in every case, what you're looking at is 
reasonably large scale commercial agriculture, not little tiny farms, but farms of significant size, significant enough that it's almost certain that they're farms that are in wholesale agriculture. So, so, so these are the kinds of farms that produce roughly 99% of the food we eat. Uh, but in each of these pictures, you'll see that that farm exists in an environmental setting. Uh, agriculture is not just independent of the environment, it is a part of the environment. And it is in some ways, to the extent to which we're able to make that true, uh, that we're gonna be able to survive the years uh, that come. So American Farmland Trust was formed um, in 1980. So this was the year following the, the decade of the 1970s in which an amazing environmental uh, revolution had been taking place. So 1970, I think, was the year that the Environmental Protection Agency was uh, created, or just briefly before. Uh, I think 1970 was Earth Day, the first Earth Day. Uh, and then uh, over the course of that decade, uh, really clustered more or less uh, in a few years in the 1970s, the United States Congress passed a series of environmental laws that were truly astounding. Uh, nothing like it had ever been seen before. So we got in that few, in that small period of years, we got the uh, Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, Toxics Control, the list goes on. There were at least literally a dozen really widespread, very important pieces of environmental le uh, legislation passed during that time period. Uh, and it had never happened before, and it has certainly not happened since, and certainly not uh, recently. At the same time, there was a revolution taking place in uh, the U.S. Uh, in uh, conservation easements for both in general and for agriculture and in the land trust movement. In 1980, there really were only probably a couple of handfuls of, of land trusts in the country. They were legal, they were still, they were operating, but there were very, very few of them. Today, we have like 1,400 land trusts in the U.S. It was truly a revolution in land trusts and in the use of conservation easements. 1980 was also, of course, in the midst of the booming post-World War II economy. So you had this revolution taking place in international trade. You had new technologies for refrigeration and container shipping. It hasn't, it obviously hadn't exploded like it has today, but it had truly exploded. Uh, even then it was taking place in a manner that what was making agriculture competitive throughout the planet. Up until then, uh, really the only some uh, farm products, the dry bulk commodity products like corn, wheat, sugar, uh, soy, cotton, uh, products that could store easily and be easily shipped for long distances over long periods of time, those were the products that were traded internationally. Starting along about this post-World War II period and certainly by the 1980s, every single uh, farm product was in competition globally. And that meant that farmers in America who had never needed to compete internationally before, they now did need to compete. And they were competing against every kind of operation from every country under every circumstance. Well, they had some advantages, right? Uh, one of the advantages that they had was access to technology. Uh, it was possible for American farmers to use uh, high tech and, and uh, mass production equipment, uh, but that technology was expensive. It was costly, but they also had another advantage. Uh, we live in a, in a, uh, a farm or in a, a, a democratic country, a stable modern democracy that was stable and, and provided uh, stable foundations for the legal systems that we need. So if you were a lender, you could loan money and have hope that you perhaps might get your money back at some point. As a result, uh, credit costs were relatively low and our farmers were able to borrow. And borrow they did. Uh, 
one of the big backdrops to the formation of American Farmland Trust was this massive growth of farm debt uh, in the U.S. farm economy that resulted in about 1985 in a collapse, uh, a debt collapse uh, in agriculture uh, that was uh, pretty much historic, like nothing we'd ever seen before. Uh, keep in mind that when uh, that debt in agriculture is almost always secured by land. So a debt crisis is a land crisis. Uh, and all of this was taking place uh, throughout this period leading up to and immediately following formation of AFT in 1980. At the same time, there were these new, new concerns about sprawl. It was an agricultural land study done in 1980 that showed that some 3 million acres per year of uh, agricultural land were disappearing from agriculture and those lands when they disappeared they were falling uh, to development. Um, in fact much of our very most productive land is in the area where they're vulnerable where those farms are vulnerable to development. It's not surprising if you think about it. Uh, in post-World War II, uh, I just think this is amazing, in, in post-World War II uh, the most productive agricultural county in the United States was, believe it or not, Los Angeles County. <laughs> uh, that's, just, that's just staggering when you look at Los Angeles County today. But that just reflects the fact that our cities grew up where the people were, and our people were where the farmers were. They were on the farms that, uh, that had existed previously. So all of that represents sort of the context in which American Farmland Trust was born. So this situation that had emerged by the 1980s uh, was creating something of a conundrum for agriculture. Uh, our founders of the organization were people of vision, both on the board and uh, the people that were hired uh, on staff. They wanted to solve this massive problem, uh, but the the situation was that they knew that if they formed a land trust for agriculture, uh, that, uh, that they were fully aware that, that if they basically, all they did was kind of sit around and wait for a, a, a landowner to walk in the door wanting to donate a conservation easement, or perhaps go out and try and raise some money uh, charitably to purchase some easements, uh, if that's the kind of uh, vision that they had, they really were not going to get the problem solved at the massive state at national scale that it existed. They needed to do something much more dramatic than that. Uh, so what they launched, what they realized immediately that they had to work in the public policy arena. There were no choices. Uh, uh, and so think about it. Uh, you're working in the public policy arena and you've got these great ideas for how you're gonna save agriculture and protect farms and from development and, and presumably also protect the environment. So you walk into a legislator's office, you know that the very first thing that legislator is gonna ask you is, well, sure, I, it sounds like a great idea, uh, but uh, so tell me, where are the farmers on this? Uh, and uh, you know, if, if they don't ask that question, you know that the second question they're gonna ask is, well, so uh, where are the egg, where are the environmental community? Where's the smart growth community on your uh, proposition? You want to save farmland? Where are those folks? If your answer to those questions are, well, gee, I don't know, or we haven't really talked to them, or uh, gee, they're not really in support of what we're uh, offering here. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're just history. You're uh, you're out of there. Uh, and that had to have been patently obvious to. Uh, uh, AFT at the very beginning, if it, if it hadn't been, it certainly soon would have become so, they knew that they needed both support from the mainstream commercial agriculture sector and from the mainstream smart growth and environmental community. Uh, I might add that if they were saving farmland and the farmland they saved was going to be managed in a way that was a net environmental uh, loss, uh, they, there's no way they were going to get environmental support either. So that's a situation, considering that farmers and environmentalists were sort of long-standing bitter enemies, that's, that has to have given people pause, uh, really, at the very start. Uh, and it did. Uh, it's, it, that conundrum is why AFT ended up 
uh, creating the organization as a as a new organization rather than uh, uh, asking another uh, existing organization to take on the protection of farmland because they did. They in fact asked the Nature Conservancy to step in and TNC uh, Peggy Rockefeller, AFT's founder, uh, one, uh, was the person that was on, was also on the Nature Conservancy board. I'm sure they didn't want to tell Peggy Rockefeller, the wife of David Rockefeller, that that uh, I'm sorry that they weren't going to do it. But that's what they told her, and it was because of this very problem. How are they going to how are they going to deal with an organization that had to be support had to have support from both farmers and from environmentalists? And so, of course, when AFT formed. It faced the same problem. It 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 had to get that problem solved if it was going to make uh, a success of this. Well, they did it, uh, and uh, they did it for kind of a variety of reasons that don't leap out uh, initially, and until you start to think about them more carefully. Uh, probably the first and foremost of of these is the fact that. Uh, you know, it, it, at the time, a lot of people were thinking farms were a, an environmental hazard. They were environmentally negative. Uh, there were people that thought that the environmentalists that no doubt considered farmers to be uh, something of the enemy. The, the problem with that approach uh, is that farms, when you lose them, it, it, it isn't as simple as being able to do away with farms. Uh, when you lose farms, they do not convert to native forest. What they do is they get sold to the highest bidder, and the highest bidder is almost inevitably the, the person, the institution, that is prepared to pay the, uh, the price needed, uh, is able to use that land for its highest and best use, the real estate term, um, as ironic as sometimes that term seems. Uh, once you realize that when that farm goes out of business, there needs to be another farmer. Uh, to take over, and, if, and that farmer is going to face the same circumstances that might have driven the first farmer out of business. So if you're going to have a farm, it's a business, the business has to succeed at least reasonably well, the farmer has to profit from it, be able to earn a living from it. If you don't have that farmer, then you start with something that looks somewhat like this, uh, but it doesn't turn into this when the farm goes away. Instead, what it does is it turns into something that looks more like this. And I think it's not hard to see that the environmental difference between this and this, as dramatic as, as, it, as it is, there's also a rather incredible difference between uh, a landscape that looks like this and one that looks like this. Uh, landscapes that do, in fact, look like this one uh, offer some amazing opportunities. So think about, uh, flooding, think about wildlife, wetlands, aquifer recharge, climate impacts. That farm, uh, this farm is able to tap into uh, opportunities to use the new now AFT uh, uh, supported uh, federal programs and, and a whole host of conservation practices to operate that farm in a manner that is a net environmental gain. Uh, sure, it's always going to be better for the environment if humans didn't exist, if we didn't need to eat, and therefore if the farm didn't have to exist, but it does. It's a part of our footprint from existing on this planet. So what a, a USDA and NRCS, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, has done over the years is evolve literally hundreds of conservation practices. So things like uh, things that most of us are very familiar with, cover crops, digesters, uh, you know, buffers, livestock, waste lagoons, rotational grazing. These practices have all been designed in a way that they can be put into use by a farmer. Yes, there's a cost, but hopefully they can be put into use and in a way that's consistent with that farmer also operating uh, as a profitable farming operation. And if you're curious at all about some of these practices, I, I find them, frankly, just astounding. There are hundreds, literally, they're all listed, described in detail in the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Services Field Office Tech Guide. Uh, sometimes if you're a nerd like me, take a look at that tech guide. I think you'll see what I mean. It's rather an amazing a body of work. And all of that is available to farmers. If that farm disappears and turns into this, 
any opportunity to make use of that stuff, it's gone. Uh, it's history. It's never going to happen again. So what did happen? Well, uh, what happened uh, was American Farmland Trust put together uh, what was is now called the Conservation Coalition. And that this happened, uh, amazingly enough, literally five years after American Farmland Trust uh, first came on the scene. Uh, organization was formed in 1980, and by 1985, it had created the Conservation Coalition. And in the Farm Bill in 1985, the very first conservation title in the history of the Farm Bill was created. And I, I say that, I use the term conservation. Uh, keep in mind, I'm sure we all know that conservation as a term is, is used in kind of a variety of ways. Uh, 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 tri in the traditional sort of agricultural use of the term conservation means uh, conserving my farm, conserving the soil and, and, and the, the nutrients and, and materials that are on my farm so that I can grow a crop. That's sort of a, 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 a sort of a traditional ag um, read of what conservation means. What conservation doesn't always mean is environmental. It doesn't always necessarily mean that the things that I do on my farm are done in a way that will help me avoid having an impact elsewhere. So in the local stream or in the climate or to wildlife, migratory birds, that kind of thing. That conservation title did in fact incorporate that larger definition of conservation. Uh, and there were some amazing things that happened, things that believe it or not, until 1985 had never been done before. So one of those was conservation compliance. As of 1985, if you were a farmer and you were farming lands that were environmentally vulnerable, maybe they were highly erosive and so a, a danger to the local stream, or maybe they were wetlands in some way, highly vulnerable lands. If you wanted to continue farming those lands, you would not get access to the farm bill programs that were your traditional programs, like for example, price support programs or, or uh, other subsidies or other pro, uh, farm bill programs, you lost access to those programs unless you had in place a conservation management plan for that land that managed it in accordance with those conservation management practices that I, I mentioned. Uh, that had never been done before. Conservation compliance has been a part of every single farm bill since. That happened in 1985. It was in the first conservation title in the U.S. Farm Bill history. Another thing that happened in 1985 was the Conservation Reserve Program. This is a classic for collaboration. I, what you had is you had farmers who in the past had had land banks, right? The federal government would pay them to keep their land out of agriculture. They'd probably plant a cover crop there uh, in order to drive down the production of crops and hopefully drive up the price. That was one of the theories that was in common use. So farmers were used to land banks uh, and they hadn't had one for a while. Meanwhile, you had sportsmen, hunters across the country who were seeing declines in their ability to, uh, uh, to hunt for birds because the birds were going away uh, because the birds lacked habitat. So this, these sporting groups were all for uh, finding ways to enhance habitat. Meanwhile, of course, you had the environmental community that desperately wanted to, to conserve and protect some uh, natural vegetation and natural wildlife habitat across the country. So bingo, you've got the formula. You put that all together if you're AFT and you end up with a conservation reserve program by which if you're a farmer, you can lease your land over a long period of time, 10 or 15 years perhaps, and then and the, the uh, government will pay you a lease payment so you don't lose money on this proposition. In turn, that land gets planted, not just with a cover crop, it gets planted back to native habitat, and it in that way begins to provide uh, uh, native vegetation, and it begins to provide native habitat for, uh, for uh, the birds and other wildlife. Conservation Reserve Program has existed ever since. It exists today. It's one of the most popular farm bill programs we have in existence. Happened in 1985 because of the Conservation Coalition. 
that was largely created uh, at the behest of the American Farmland Trust. Another thing that happened in 1985, if you were a farmer in 1985 and your uh, farm was, uh, 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 you wanted to adopt some of these conservation practices, but they were just too expensive. It was too costly and you really couldn't afford to do it. You couldn't get any help from the government for the doing of that. But the 1985 farm, uh, farm Bill created the EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the very first conservation incentives program. It's continued in the years since. Uh, today, if you want help, you've got a pretty good chance of being able to get a 50% cost share from the federal government for the installation of some of those more expensive conservation practices that you'd like to adopt. Uh, but keep in mind, you're existing in a very competitive environment, so you don't have a lot of leeway about what you can afford to do. This program dramatically helps. That EQIP program and other spinoffs from it have grown in every farm bill since. I might add that that conservation coalition still exists today, has existed ever since. And right now today, you can get help with that from the government. Similarly, if in 1985 you were a farmer and you owned land that was uh, somewhere uh, in the, on the urban edge in some of those areas that are vulnerable to urban growth and sprawl, there really was only one solution uh, to keeping your land uh, out of development and in agriculture, it was zoning. That was it. There, there were no other growth management and zoning. That was all that there was. And so again, just like adopting conservation practices, uh, the, it came out of your pocket. If you wanted to protect your land, if you wanted to maybe create an agricultural easement to protect your land so that it wouldn't get developed, man, you paid for that out of your own pocket. Nobody helped. Uh, there was no such thing as a purchase of development rights programs. But uh, in the years not too long after the 1985 Farm Bill, uh, uh, in, in programs that sort of emerged and grew to the point where they were pretty well funded by 2002 and now today are pretty reasonably funded across the country. Uh, AFT created a federal purchase of agricultural conservation easements program, a uh, PACE program, uh, that by which the federal government supports local communities that are uh, interested in and, and uh, willing to uh, purchase agricultural easements from local farmers as an, an aid to, and uh, in some cases, perhaps a substitute for uh, zoning laws. That didn't exist up until AFT uh, put together the uh, coalition to support it. Uh, and then, of course, there was the growth of the land trust movement. Some of that, and certainly the land trust movement's involvement in agricultural easements in the farm issue, was very much on AFT's mind throughout that period of massive growth in land trusts. Uh, so AFT had a lot to do with the land trust movement's involvement in agricultural easements. And then, of course, all over that same period of time since 1985, there was an explosion of state and local PACE programs that uh, I'll talk about. But this is all sort of the national picture of stuff that AFT did that created I just think of are some amazing uh, successes uh, that uh, that emerged from the creation of the conservation uh, coalition and through the work of American Farmland Trust. And I just think it's an amazing case in point for an organization that started out uh, facing such incredibly difficult odds. Uh, what they did is they discovered the power of collaboration. And that power is really and truly amazing. Meanwhile, <laughs> AFT also expanded throughout the country. Uh, uh, I became AFT's regional director in uh, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, the, the Northwest office in 1980. Uh, I was one of the last local or regional offices that AFT created. And there were uh, the, the very first thing that I really, really badly wanted to do was to create a Washington state purchase of development rights program or purchase of agriculture, agricultural conservation easements program uh, that by which the state would help fund either itself or and or through local programs, local county programs, uh, purchase of easements. Uh, 
At the time, the Farm Bureau in Washington was opposed for reasons which probably made pretty good sense to them at the time. I spent two years trying to convince them otherwise, and one of the things I'm sort of proudest of is, uh, is that they did, in fact. Uh, the Farm Bureau came around, and, and in the end, and that today, they are uh, supporters of our state's purchase of agricultural easement programs. Uh, another thing that, and that happened, by the way, those, those were happening all over the country, just exactly the same kind of thing that I'm describing here for Washington State, that kind of thing happened in regional offices all over the country. Another Washington example that's similar to stuff that happened all over was our Pioneers in Conservation Grants Program. We have a salmon problem here in Washington State. Uh, and pretty much everything that you do in terms of development and agriculture and whatever activity you're in, you're gonna have an impact on salmon. We had a grants program to help farmers pay the cost of providing, uh, improving salmon habitat on the streams and rivers that ran through and by their properties. And the program was designed in a way that the grant would help enhance salmon habitat, while at the same time, it would help the farm business. And while it seems a little odd, how would you do that? In fact, it turns out there are all kinds of examples of how a farmer by uh, improving salmon habitat can also uh, strengthen the farm business. Uh, we had a tremendous program of that kind. Programs like that, again, there were programs of that kind in one way, shape, or form all over the country. Another example were the integrated pest management programs uh, that were being administered all across uh, the U.S. Um, uh, in Washington State, just one of, there were dozens of these uh, grants that we were able to provide to uh, farmers all across the state of the region, actually. One of them was our Washington State University's site-specific weather net that provided very, very local site-specific weather data that was then broadcast to a hilltop somewhere and then would appear on the farmer's uh, mobile uh, while the farmer stood in the field could tell right there in that field uh, what the sort of history of weather had been up to that point and know exactly when the pests that were a uh, problem needed to be sprayed for. Uh, so by virtue of that, a lot of, uh, a lot of application of organophosphate pesticides uh, that had occurred unnecessarily early and had continued unnecessarily late, a lot of that was eliminated because the farmer knew exactly when that pesticide was actually going to be needed. Again, a fantastic outcome for the environment. Also helped the farmers because those pesticides are not cheap, as I'm sure a lot of you folks know. Uh, so again, a big benefit for both agriculture and the environment. I, 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 I want to also say, uh, again, uh, and I think this kind of thing is happening throughout the country. Uh, we had a recent bill in the state of Washington in which we, it was a climate bill, uh, in which incentives, uh, conservation incentives funding from the state government for farmers participating in regenerative agriculture that uh, stores carbon in the soil, uh, <clears throat> that bill provides conservation, state conservation incentives uh, for, to those farmers. Now, and that's, a, that's brand new. That just happened this year. And I might add, it's a first because uh, typically all of the incentive money has come from the federal government, at least uh, here in the Northwest. Uh, that's a first. And I think that kind of thing is, again, happening all across the country. So how do these things come about? I mean, really, how do you get that to happen? Uh, it's both complicated and simple, right? Uh, from AFT's perspective, the first was AFT had to always speak the, the truth, the same truth to both sides. And in fact, sometimes the best, uh, the, the best circumstances are, are situations where you've got farmers and environmentalists in the same audience listening to the same presentation. So they can hear when you're making your case to the, the, the environmentalists are seated, they can hear when you're making your case to the farmers. And suddenly when they hear that, they get it. And the farmers are sitting there when you're making your case to the environmental community, they, they hear it and they get suddenly, they get why the environmental community might care and why this can work and why that collaboration is possible, what could come of it. That's some of the most powerful stuff uh, that you can get. Obviously, AFT had to have 
credibility, and, and we had to build that credibility from the get-go. Obviously, also, if old solutions uh, weren't working, we needed new ones. We needed creative solutions that addressed the needs of both parties, uh, agriculture uh, farmers and environmentalists. And when you've got new programs, uh, new prospects, new uh, sort of uh, you know, opportunities, you got to do the research. You've got to have the research that that shows that in fact those programs are needed, and that in fact uh, those programs will work. It was other things like don't take credit. Uh, you've heard me take a lot of credit for American Farmland Trust uh, in this presentation, and for which I apologize to other organizations that have been very very instrumental in the, in adopting all of this stuff uh, in the legislative arena. Who knows? truly, whoever knows, uh, who was responsible for getting something done. Uh, so I'm taking credit in a way that for AFT in a way that AFT would never do. And I apologize for that. But the bottom line is, if you take too much credit, uh, then people don't come back. They don't want to work with you anymore. They don't want to collaborate. Why should I collaborate with you? You end up taking all the credit at the end. So the bottom line is, AFT doesn't take credit. Uh, very often. And, and that's part of the reason most of us don't know <laughs> that a lot of this stuff has even occurred. Um, collaboration, I, I don't want to oversimplify. Collaboration is a, uh, it, you know, it's a subject of academic studies. It's, there's, there's, there's college curricula on the topic. There are many, many, many books written. I mean, it's a whole field of endeavor. And so, and, and all of that work is incredibly important. But Keep in mind also that in some ways it comes down to one fairly simple proposition, uh, and that is that you show respect. It's that you have genuine respect for the participants in a process and, and treat them uh, with the respect that they deserve. AFT did that, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. And I think therein lies really probably, it, it, in my view, the principal lesson from all of this, the object lesson from AFT's experience, uh, show respect, work together, and miracles become possible. I want to also just make a quick mention of uh, climate uh, and of the future. Um, it turns out that if 25% if, if of our world's global greenhouse gases uh, are created by agriculture. It turns out if we could get farmers to adopt conservation management, in particularly healthy soil management practices, those practices sequester enough carbon that we could actually, con uh, actually transform agriculture from a net generator of greenhouse gases into a net carbon sink. Just think how significant that would be. Instead of being 25% of our greenhouse gases being generated by agriculture, they'd actually be soaking up carbon produced from other sources. I, I think that's just amazing. Uh, it's why AFT's work is so absolutely incredible, because in the end, we need our farmers to become more than just the producers of our food. We need them to be, help us become the saviors of our planet. Uh, I'm convinced that if we set this goal for agriculture with an understanding that our farmers are in business and have to make a living. But if we set that goal for agriculture, uh, put our farmers to creating uh, habitat and, uh, and the like uh, and, and environmental values, I think they're gonna produce those values uh, as efficiently as they today produce wheat and carrots. So uh, I think that that's a huge part of where we need to be headed in the years to come. And if we do that, then we address our food problem. It allows us to feed ourselves. It allows us to address uh, the Earth's critical ecosystems uh, and allows us to do that, hopefully, by overcoming crippling political deadlock. So it strikes me that what this really amounts to uh, is an American Farmland Trust looking closely actually holds some answers that are of I think just kind of monumental existence for all of us. So that's it, that's my presentation. And I gather we've got some time for questions.
All right, thank you, Don. Um, I'll stop here. There. Yeah, there we go. So we'll take questions from the audience. Again, you can put them in that Q&A um, feature and Michelle will place um, in the chat a link to buy Don's book from Arizona or Phoenix's locally owned and beloved Changing Hands bookstore. Um, and so then, so there is one question here. Um, this is a good one. So Don, how do we make land trusts more equitable and more specifically, how do we transfer land and easements to a more diverse next generation of producers? And this comes from my colleague at the Sweetie Center, Colleen Family. Well, I I I think that is, and I and I it's nothing was there was nothing in my presentation about this, and maybe there should have been, but in, in my kind of looking at this in the broad picture, uh, what is needed is to integrate all across the spectrum of the issues we face. And the environmental issue is actually only one of them. Uh, agriculture needs to become uh, and be seen as and appreciated as and, and uh, a, 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 as a integral part of the larger society in which we all live. We need to have our urban areas and our rural areas working together to address these problems, just like farmers and environmentalists uh, work together to address some of our uh, environmental problems, uh, while also continuing to be able to provide food. Uh, and so this matter of equity, uh, of making sure that uh, the owners of our farms represent uh, our society, that we have uh, women and, and um, other minorities uh, participating in farmers and becoming a part of the farm culture, just like uh, they are elsewhere. That all that that's all just I think just critically important as we make sort of as agriculture increasingly becomes a reflection of who we are. All of us are as a society. Uh, AFT has has programs right now where they're working with uh, women farm owners, uh, farm operators, uh, working with uh, non-operating uh, owners, of which there are many, and many of them are women, uh, and working also with underserved populations to make sure that they are uh, able to get access to agricultural land, which, as you might imagine, when farms are, when the price of land is driven up by all these other uses and needs, uh, it's very difficult to afford farmland for anybody, and certainly for someone who's uh, facing special struggles. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Gabrielle Roche McNally, who runs the Women for the Land program at AFT, we went to school together at Iowa State University. So she's fantastic. Um, that question actually made me think of there was a line in your book that I highlighted because I wanted to go back and look at it. And I have you here. So now I can just ask you about it. Um, so you say that AFT's initial work may have disappointed Father McKnight, who was the a civil rights activist with the Southern Cooperative Development Fund. Um, and as you mentioned, his invitation to join the board was, I think, really revolutionary at that time. And I'm wondering if you know more about that, or if it's just sort of something lost to history, because I know- I, I, I don't, I, I'm a father, I don't know, Father McKnight may still be around and he could perhaps answer that question. Uh, I, I, I do know that we have a, a board member from the, the uh, same organization today uh, on the AFT board. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm very, as you mentioned, AFT is very conscious of and working really hard in this arena. Uh, and it's an important one. I, but I'm just judging by the fact that he stayed on the board only one year and AFT had a lot of longevity in its board members. Uh, so uh, probably it, I'm just guessing, right? Because I'd have to I'd have to ask. Uh, but that's 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 what led to the to that line. I I, I and I, I I think AFT has done a lot of work of late that uh, that has moved back in that direction. Thankfully. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, can you discuss a bit the political realities in Washington D.C.? Is there bipartisan support for including regenerative agriculture or climate-friendly practices in the farm bill? You know, I'm I'm I have to be a little careful. I'm not 
I'm not as clued in to exactly what's going on in DC at the moment, uh, but I do know that this is a major front for American Farmland Trust. Um, John Piotti, uh, who joined the organization just four years ago, the current uh, uh, president, one of his principal reasons for taking the job was his conviction that uh, agriculture needed to be uh, at the forefront of addressing our climate issues. Uh, and that in doing so, if we play our cards right, it could actually help agriculture in the process. Uh, and so I would say that's the front. I, and I would have to say, you know, to whatever extent climate is of concern, um, you know, AFT is going to be there trying to bring farmers into this and trying to, to, to provide ways in which farmers can afford to be uh, a solution to these problems. And I, and <clears throat> so I don't, I can't, I can't really specifically answer that question very well, but I, I know that it's an absolute major battlefront for the organization and of major concern for them. Thank you. Um, I have another question that is specific to Arizona. Um, so culturally in Arizona, producing, producers may tend to be more conservative or libertarian. Um, and so the question is, do you think that it's possible for land trusts um, to be shorter term, and if that might be a way of creating this compromise between what, as you saw in Washington with the Farm Bureau, this reticence to put something away, quote unquote, forever? I, I, this was, I remember this so well. Uh, we had a debate. I actually convinced the Farm Bureau and the Cattlemen's Association, and I assure you, by the way, that uh, Eastern Washington uh, farmers uh, are, my guess is, every bit as uh, conservative uh, and business oriented as our farmers in Arizona. Uh, and, and, but we had a debate on this topic. And I remember this was one of the questions that came up by, you know, you're going to put this land in, in uh, perpetuity. Uh, I mean, that's a long time, right? Uh, so what about the rights of people down the road uh, years from now? And the answer to that is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, if you think about it, uh, 50 or 100 or 150 years from now, if somebody wants to farm and wants to find a farm parcel uh, to be able to do so, um, if we do nothing uh, and the fragmentation of agricultural land continues as it's happening today, uh, that piece of land won't exist. And I guarantee you, if you take 100 acres and divide it into uh, 100 one acre pieces and sell it off to 100 different people, that is permanent. That is, man, that's perpetuity writ large. That's never going back, uh, not outside of some gargantuan, highly unrealistic uh, condemnation and massively costly condemnation program. So once that land's divided up, that, that's the definition of permanent. Uh, if what instead you do, do is you protected that land, then the farmer that owns it now has been paid for that. If that land's protected with a purchased easement, that farmer that owns it today has been paid its full market value, did that voluntarily, I might add. And then when that farmer sells that land to another farmer, that new farmer that buys it and every farmer down the road since pays less for that land because the development value has been taken away from it. So that farmer also has been allowed to purchase and owns that land at a considerably reduced cost. So everybody involved has been treated fairly and, and has been treated properly. And my feeling is no matter how permanent an agricultural easement is, it's never going to be as permanent as development. Yeah, that's, I'm convinced. <laughs> really well put. Um, we have another question, and I'm going to reframe it a little bit just because I think AFT works within the, the US context. Um, so the question is about the role and importance of small scale producers. And I know there is some tension about this because in the US, small scale producers don't manage the majority of the land um, in the US. I know globally that statistic looks differently, but how do you think the role of small scale producers? I guess, how does it look in this sort of land preservation idea? I, 
AFT represents them all. <laughs> and and I, I got to say, small scale, especially our small direct market urban edge producers play a really, really fundamental role in this, a role that not everybody gets right off, uh, but they're in contact with the public. <laughs> they're in contact with a conscious segment of the public uh, that cares about farms and cares about where their food comes from and how it's grown. So those producers uh, acquire intelligence about the marketplace in a way that uh, a wholesale farmer never can. Uh, and, and they also uh, are missionaries uh, to the public uh, for agriculture uh, because uh, those small scale producers, uh, you know, they're not a bunch of crazy liberals either, uh, you know, uh, and, and they know what's going on and they're in business to make a living. So the bottom line is I think they play an incredible role. Okay, so that said, however, the direct market agriculture in this country actually represents not just the land percentage is tiny, but the actual percentage of the marketplace is also very, very, very tiny. It's only maybe uh, maybe one percent or something of the marketplace is very small. If if we don't set this system up in a way that includes mainstream commercial agriculture, farms that are, are selling wholesale. Uh, are in the business of providing the other 99% of the food that we eat, then we're sort of we're, we're sort of spinning our wheels. So so and I, there, there, I might add there's one other way in which those small farmers, a lot of those small farmers pioneered organic. A lot of those and, that, and a lot of that organic stuff that they pioneered has become integrated pest management practices that then get played out on the broader commercial landscape. So so they're. They're, those small farmers are really important, but at the same time, we've got to design our systems and our policies so that it includes and encompasses large scale agriculture. Because if we don't do that, then you know, the problem's just way too big uh, not, to, not to approach it in a, in a landscape scale. Thank you. A great answer. Um, we've gotten a couple questions about this, so I'm going to wrap them into one. Um, can you discuss your thoughts on conservation easements in urban agricultural settings and the importance of maybe conserving smaller acreage farms? Um, so the, some have felt that much attention is brought to conserving the larger acreage farms. And so your thoughts on that? Well, you know, uh in some ways, I, I've, here's, here's what I think. You've got to, I think politically <laughs> about this stuff. Uh, and I've always thought that uh, there is a place for conservation easement programs that have an environmental component, right? To where the primary purpose is to preserve a farm. But among the important reasons you preserve that farm is that that farm is providing environmental values, environmental services. So that's one very important rationale for supporting, protecting farmland. And that rationale uh, is supported by a constituency of people who care about the environment. So there's another constituency, a constituency that cares just about farms. They want farms, they want farm businesses, they want farm businesses to succeed. Uh, they don't really, they're not thinking about environmental issues. They're thinking about farms and farm businesses and being able to find, find and buy farmland at a price you can afford. That constituency, perhaps a more traditional agricultural constituency, needs programs that focus on farms as productive businesses. And the, the farms that they want protected are the farms that are successful farming businesses, hopefully larger scale successful businesses. They should have a program. That's an important value. We need to protect those farms. There's also a third constituency and a rather powerful one that's growing and that's the local food constituency. I mean, if you don't have a local farm, <laughs> you don't have local food. 
So you've, you've got to protect these local farms in order to have a whole local food system, in order for all of the benefits of local food and, and, and local contact with local consumers uh, by small scale or, or maybe not so small scale local agriculture, all of that becomes possible if you've got local farms. So there's a constituency and maybe the principal thing that they're focused on is that that farm is sort of a, a, a key gem asset uh, in the community. It may be the last five acres in, 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 you know, as you drive 10 or 15 miles out of town, it may be the last five acre farm and it may be really important to the community in which it exists. And that farm needs, needs, needs desperately to be saved, right? So, so you've got all of these are sort of, all of these are important values contributed by agriculture. And we need programs that protect farms in, in each of these arenas. And I personally feel that there are constituencies <laughs> that would support, will support uh, purchase of development rights programs in all of these arenas. I, 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 I wouldn't be objection, I wouldn't find any objection to having there be actually in our state, for example, three different separate programs, uh, each sort of focused on some different aspect of why you wanna save agriculture. So that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. I think, I think in each case, it's very important and, and specifically with respect to local food, I don't think we're tapping into the local food uh, community's uh, uh, political clout personally as we could. Yeah, thank you. I haven't heard it broken down into those three categories. That's really helpful, I think. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm supposed to stop at 12.58. So I'm, you, you timed that perfectly, Don. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much to everyone who attended for the wonderful questions. And thank you, Don, for taking the time to come talk to us. Um, I want to say, so I read the book and it's very readable and it's a pleasure. And so I hope you all take the time to, to look through it. So with that, Michelle, do you have any parting words you'd like to say? Nope. Thanks everybody for coming. Great.